Hi everyone, welcome again here to St. John the Evangelist Church here in Agawa, Massachusetts. We're a lovely Roman Catholic parish here in the Diocese of Springfield and it's still nice enough to come outside for these little Q&As and it's kind of a race against time, a race against the sun. So I'm excited to, uh, to be able to be with you and, and to face some of your questions. So I don't have my uh, phone right here in front of me. I'm sure one of our staff and our Volunteers are going to help us out so I can get your questions, but um, but I am excited that we can spend a few moments here. Hopefully, we'll be able to deal with it. If we can't get our phone, maybe I can bring out my little uh, gizmo here. You know, it depends if I get the get the signal. Hopefully, I will. But we do hope to get your questions. Okay, let's try this a little differently. <laughs> and we got a nice little honk from Mary, taking a ride down Main Street here, probably heading home after the six o'clock mass. So it was great to, uh, great to see her and great to see you all. So I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing what I can here. Excuse, okay, TikTok. You know, it's 7.15. We started this earlier this week than we did last week and the sun's even lower. Can you believe it? One week, and it goes that fast. So I don't know. Okay. So this is my phone, and it's a little, uh, a little old. Um, it's, I, it's, yeah, it's, I, I don't even know what number it is, an iPhone 4 or something like that. And then I had a, a generous parishioner, actually, Mary, who just drove by, who gave me her old iPhone 6 or 7 or whichever this is, but I don't have it connected to my phone, so I'm just... I told you, me and technology are, are rough. Are rough. So, I know, I hope, I hope we're on. I trust that we are. And, um, and we're just kind of flying through with this. As I'm opening this up here, I, I have one of the open pages on my, on my uh, phone here on the... Um, Bolletino of the Sala Stampa at the Vatican. And what is that? But it's the bulletin of the press office. And I was looking it up because I was looking it up because we had some uh, interesting news yesterday from Pope Francis here for the uh, news of consequence uh, of great interest here for us in Western Massachusetts in the Diocese of Springfield. Pope Francis had appointed yesterday uh, an apostolic administrator for our diocese. I don't know if you know, perhaps you do, but Bishop Mitchell Rosansky, who was installed as Bishop of Springfield here in 2014, he uh, was named, he was named uh, the Archbishop of St. Louis. And so he... Uh, okay, I can hear my phone talking right back at me. I don't know if you can hear it, but we're going to bring the sound down. He was named the Archbishop of St. Louis um, back in June. June uh, was it June 10th? I can't even remember now. And, um, and, and so once he was named Archbishop of St. Louis, Archbishop designate, designate he was no longer um, Bishop of Springfield. He was no longer as it were, the shepherd of this flock, he was the apostolic administrator. So Bishop Rosensky for the past two months was apostolic administrator of our diocese. And yesterday on the feast of St. Louis, King of France, he was installed as the Archbishop of St. Louis, the great city in Missouri, the beautiful arch. And he had a beautiful homily that, uh, reminiscing on that arch in St. Louis, that very uh, symbolic and significant uh, sign, and uh, the, the St. Louis as the gateway to the West, the gateway to the American frontier. And he spoke of how we as Christians are called to be gateways of faith, gateways of hope, gateways of love to to bring people to Christ, to to be an open uh, to be an open as a way passage. Uh, for people of faith to, to come to know the Lord. And, and we are called to be gateways and not gatekeepers. And that was a beautiful homily, and I hope you were able to see it. Maybe you can see it online. 
where you can see it on EWTN. I know some of our parishioners did. But once he was named Archbishop of, uh, effectively, Archbishop of St. Louis, he was no longer uh, serving as apostolic administrator. And, Bish and Pope Francis appointed Bishop Robert McManus of, Saint, um, of Worcester. So he's a local Massachusetts bishop, not too far. He's been serving since, I think, 2002, 2004, back in, um, um, back in the days of Pope St. John Paul II. And Pope, uh, Pope Francis uh, appointed uh, Bishop McManus as our, as our uh, apostolic administrator. And so he will be serving here locally uh, helping us out to kind of steady the boat as we continue to wait for a new Bishop of Springfield. So I'm going to pull this up here. We got a couple of questions and I am going to uh, try to see if I can bring these around. I know that our volunteers are also working to make this work. So we will see. If you just bear with me just a moment. That way I can get your questions right as they come. Hopefully we're zoomed in nicely. Maybe you can see the beautiful flags that we had here in the church. We got the, um, we've got the um, open doors of the church. As we try to keep them open as long as we can. I hope you know that. We try to keep them open as long as we can. But sometimes we just can't. Uh, you know, we need to lock up in the evenings. We got to make sure it goes. So thank you for bearing with me for a few more seconds here while we pull this up. We'll be sure to have our phones and our technologies ready to go next time we do this. So uh, sometimes we'll have a computer or we'll have, I'm really grateful to our uh, St. John's, St. John's Media Group. They really do a lot of uh, legwork. They help set up the tables and they help set up everything. So okay, we're going to get there. So we, we did have a question last week about um, the flags, you know, the Vatican flag, which is just over my left shoulder on the right side of your screen. The Vatican flag is um, is is gold and and white. I don't really know the significance of the colors, but you may see it when it flutters in the wind a little bit. You may see that it has um, an emblem on it, and it's got the emblem of the um, the three regnum, the three the 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 tiara, the three crowns. Um, the three portion, three layered crown of uh, the Pope. And, and um, Pope John Paul I, I want to say, was the first one to either, uh, or was the last one, to wear the tree regnum. And it, it's a sign of the temporal power of the church, that the Pope is as much a, um, the Pope is as much a spiritual leader, but he is as much a, leader in the world, a human leader, as he is a, a spiritual leader. Because the church is in the world, but not of the world. Remember we talked about that last week? The church is in the world, but not of the world. And the Pope, um, although he is a spiritual leader, although he is leading us out of the world, uh, the church is in the world. The church is in the world. And so the church has a place in the world. And the, the tree regnum signifies, um, signifies the temporal power of the Pope. Now, it used to be that the Pope had papal states. You know, the, the Pope, even until the 1870s, the Pope, had, the Pope had territory. And all that was taken away in the, in the 1870s when, when Italy was really constituted as the modern nation as we understand it. It used to be a lot of different kingdoms, a lot of different... Um, states and the um, and in the 1870s there was the great there was the great um, conflict and the the great independence of the modern Italian state under Vittorio Emanuele and that's when the Pope lost all of his temporal power in his papal state so he didn't even have a kingdom to, to as it were to rule but it's not to rule the kingdom that the Pope is elected. It's not to rule the kingdom that the Pope is the Vicar of Christ. No, it's to bring the gospel, to manifest the gospel uh, to the people of God. So we, um, we, 
so when, when, when the Pope lost that rule, he really became a prisoner of the Vatican. And from 1870 until 1923, the Pope was not able to, um, the Pope was not able to, to, to even leave parts of the Vatican. Can you imagine that? So when they were elected, they were, they were, they were as it were, became prisoners of the Vatican. And when, um, in 1923, there was, a, there was an agreement uh, signed. It was the treaty, the Lateran Treaty. And that's when the, the, there was an, array, uh, an agreement between the Italian state and the, the Vatican and the, and, the, um, and the Holy See. The, Holy, the Vatican is, is called the Vatican because it is the, um, it's the Vatican Hill. Rome is made of many hills, seven hills um, of Rome. And, and the Vatican is one of those hills. And it's the one right across the Tiber River. And... Um, and the Vatican is the name of the hill, and we call the, the central government of the church, we call it the Vatican. But, it's, um, but what it properly is, is the, um, the Holy See. It's the Sea of St. Peter. It's the Holy See. We got a little bit of wind coming here. My glasses are flying. We got friends walking by. And, um, and the Holy See is, is, is the church. Um, manifest in the world with, with corporal structure as you and I are members of the body of Christ, members of the church in the world. So, so the tree, this is long story short, the tiara, the tree regnum, is a sign of the temporal power um, of, of the place of the church in the world. And so we have a flag. Now that's not the flag of heaven. It's not the flag of heaven. It's not the standard of Christ. No, the standard of Christ is um, is Himself. He is the Lamb of God. He is the risen One. He is He is the sign of the resurrection. He is our standard. He is our flag bearer. He is our banner. But the Church, as being in the world, as you and I are in the world, has a flag, and the Tree Regnum is a sign of that temporal authority of the church that is the authority to to be in the world and and to and to, and to govern not as as it were nations but to govern um, govern the conduct of our lives in some way so i um i see we got a we got a letter here so we're going to take that thank you um so with the tree regnum with the tiara which used to be placed on the head of the pope at the day of his installation, as a sign of his, his rule, his reign, his temporal authority um, as vicar of Christ, um, it, which is no longer a practice now. As I mentioned, John Paul I, I think, was the first one who didn't have it, and then, of course, John Paul II didn't, and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis have followed that. But with the tiara, and I don't know if the wind is kicking up, maybe you see it a little bit more, there are cro- there's a cross of keys there. And what do you think those keys signify? Where have we heard about keys? We just heard it this weekend, right? That Christ gives the keys to Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so those keys are the, are the very keys uh, entrusted to St. Peter to rule, as it were, to govern to sanctify and to teach. And this rule, again, is not of authority, of power, of might, but it is the rule of, of our conduct in the world as Christians, as men and women um, called to holiness and sanctity to manifest virtues, virtues, not just privately and in our homes and personally, but in the, in the world. And this is another uh, point. So just as we talk about the keys, right? As a sign of uh, the authority of St. Peter and, the success, and his successors. We have, um, we, 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 manifest our, we manifest our faith in the world. And so this is a big question now that's coming up is, is the question of politics. And the church and the role of faith in politics. And it's not appropriate to bring politics up in a homily. 
that is to bring up particular policies, as it were, to root for one candidate or another candidate. But it is appropriate to talk about the, the sanctity and the holiness of particular platforms or particular actions. So when a political party promotes a platform that is against the teachings of the church, against fundamentally the moral law, then we do have the responsibility to, to speak against that. Now we're not here to say, well, vote for this person or vote for that person. Vote for this um, candidate or that candidate. But we are here to say that there are choices that we are called to make. And those choices have consequence. And those choices can be moral or immoral. So I invite you to, um, to recognize how in your life you are manifesting your faith not just privately in your own home, but how you're manifesting your faith publicly in the world. And it doesn't mean that you have to go around with a Catholic banner and, and say moral, moral, immoral, immoral. No, but you have to be able to be well-versed in a good argument about the, the merits of particular decisions and particular public policies. So when we talk about, you know, um, the public policies and, 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 and governmental choices when it comes to regulation of businesses or the um, establishment and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the appropriation of funds for roads or for the funding of police and fire departments, those may not have particularly moral qualifications to them, but sometimes they may. Are we putting more money into... Um, into, uh, into particular policies or programs and, and, and not paying for um, the, the, the goods of society and the care of persons who may be unable to help themselves? Are we incentivizing people and pro providing opportunities for them to earn a good day's work or to be able to uh, provide for their families? Are we establishing laws that respect life from the moment of conception to natural death? And so there are some choices that we have to be able to discern. And there's a great uh, resource that we put into our, into our bulletin that, um, that, that can help us guide our conscience and guide our decision making in, 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 the, votes, in the votes and the uh, decisions we'll be making in these coming weeks and months. You know, here in Massachusetts, there's a lot of <laughs> ads, on the, ads on, the, on the television about, um, uh, about the primary of our local congressman. And I know that's just going to get amplified all the more. It's certainly amplified now because they're, they're running for a seat that is typically of one party. And so the primary of that party is going to have a lot of, um, a lot of fight uh, because typically only one party wins this, the congressional seat here, but it may be different in, in, um, in, in the future. But, um, but we know that in many parts of the country, we're going to be getting a lot of advertisements and, and, and a lot of talk about this, par this party or this candidate and this position or that platform. Um, so it's, it's just going to get crazy, isn't it? But... Let's not get overwhelmed by all the nice imagery, by all the talking heads. Let's not get overwhelmed by all of the fanfare. But let's focus on what is actually being presented for us to choose. That's the question. What is actually being presented for us to choose? Behind the person who's speaking, behind the voice that you hear or the actions that, um, behind the voice or the or the image that you see being presented? What are the actions that are being affected? That's what we have to decide. And every four years, we make those choices. Every two years for our congressmen. Every so often in our own towns and, and communities. The choices of, of, of being able to um, bring our right conduct into good action in our communities, in our societies. 
So I'm sorry that I've, I've, I've gone on about the, uh, the, the flag a little bit. I've gone on a little bit on the, um, I'm having a difficult time pulling up our questions, but I did get um, one of our questions handed here. But if you don't mind, I'm gonna try to see if I can make this one more time. I know we've got two comments. We've got one share, we've got one like, we've got 12 people watching. I just can't get it to bring up the stuff. I told you I'm technologically inept, but our, um, our awesome friends are gonna help us out sometime. In the, in the future, and, uh, and we'll be able to open this up. See, I'm getting related videos. Maybe you people know better. Uh, you people, I mean the young people who are watching on Facebook, how I can pull this up. Maybe, maybe I can ask uh, one of our volunteers here. Thank you. So I'm gonna answer this question. What do you think the most influential, you people, hold on a second. I need to bring this back. I said you people, I mean, you who are watching, you my dear friends who are watching this and, and know how to watch videos and post questions and I'm like an adult over here, just can't even get it to run. So I've got a paper, you know, it's just easier for me to have a paper, a book to pray my breviary out of the book. We can also pray the breviary out of the smartphones, but I just like the, the paper, the printed word. It's good to hold in your hand. It lasts perhaps, um, you know, we can, this, this breviary specifically, was, was the breviary, uh, the divine office, the off, um, was, uh, was the breviary of a, uh, a fellow priest here in the Diocese of Springfield. And I don't even know who that priest was. I think he may have passed away at this point. That's why the breviary is available. But, um, but he prayed it, and now I get to pray it. And their religious sisters pray it in their communities, in their monasteries, their convents and cloisters. And, um, and, it's, and we pass it on to the next generation. So I like to have the paper in front of me, but I like to use virtual means if I can. So I hope you people will help me. What do you think the most influential thing in your growing up that may have led to your vocation? Mary Kate, thank you for asking. What was the most influential thing in my life that led to my vocation? Was the witness of my family. It was the witness of, my, um, of the people in my life. So the people in my life contributed to my vocation, helped me discern my vocation. You know, I wasn't raised in a hermitage. I wasn't a hermit in the hills. No, I was raised in a family, in a home, and I was blessed to have a family and a home in my childhood. A community that cared for me, friends, neighbors. And all of that gave, um, gave me witness Certainly my mother and my father and their faith, their work in providing for our family, their work in bringing us uh, to church, bringing us to school, bringing us to safety, and also the priests in my life and other faithful Catholics. When they would pray with my family, maybe we'd pray the, uh, maybe we'd go to mass together or share a meal and, and a, um, and a, uh, um, and share a meal and, and a, a pray a prayer of blessing, a grace before meals. So those were some, uh, those were some local and, and familial close family and friends who helped me, but also the great witness of Pope St. John Paul II. You know, the priests in my life, as I mentioned, I remember my pastor growing up and all the associates. We used to have Father Brian McGrath, who was pastor here just before me, or Father David Darcy, who's the, uh, uh, um, one of the co-directors for vocations. They were, uh, they were young priests in my parish. Father Lessard, who's now a colleague of mine in the tribunal. And I knew them when they were young priests in my parish. And the pastor there, uh, Father Howard McCormick, who ended up here after my home parish of Lee, he was here at St. John's, Father Howard McCormick. And then after Father Howard McCormick was Father Gary Daly. And, and, and to this day, Father Gary Daly is, uh, is a brother priest here in the diocese and a friend. Thank you. So, our good friends got the things here. They got them going. Yay. So, thank you. Um, so, I got some of the questions. And we're going to take a look at those. I'm try not going to lose them. But I wanted to finish the question. So the witness of the priest in my life was a powerful witness. And also that priest um, 
who, who was Pope, Pope St. John Paul II. I got to meet Pope St. John Paul II with my dad. My father had a pilgrimage um, ministry. For 30, 35 years, he was organizing pilgrimages uh, here in the United States, in, in Europe, in, in the Holy Land, bringing faithful to all parts of the world and all many shrines and Catholic places and, and places of veneration and worship uh, of, 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 of Christ our Lord and, and veneration of the saints and, and our Blessed Mother Mary. He, uh, for, for 30, 35 years, he, he led a, um, a pilgrimage office and, and many times he would bring pilgrims to Rome. And the Holy Father was always generous with his time and, and would visit us. Would meet people, whether they be affluent businessmen and, and, and donors and contributors, and, and, or he would meet married couples and, 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 um, and poor faithful who would come to visit. Pope St. John Paul II met everyone and anyone uh, as much as he could, I know. And one of those people was me. And I got to meet him. Uh, with my dad and my family a few times by, by, thanks to his work and his ministry. And, um, and John Paul II, on a, a personal level, was, was, was very father, fatherly. I remember seeing the pictures of him as he aged and, and, and was just this wonderful grandfatherly figure or the strong figure that he was in his youth. That had an influence on my life. And as I knew him as the man, I, I came to know him all the better as the priest and the pope in his writings, in his homilies. And when we can access that today, it's all online, right? Right in our hands. So that contributed to my vocation, you know. And there are also, you know, good things in my life. And, and, and there are also the different challenges that we have to face different tragedies that we have to face that inspire our holiness, but also those, those moments of our own weakness and our own sins that we have to reconcile and we have to seek God's mercy for and seek the mercy of family and friends for. So that we, no matter what comes in your life, how do you appreciate it for the good that it can be in your life or the mercy that it can be in in, in God's grace. How do you recognize any different moments in your life as signs of, um, as signs of God affecting his will in your life and your will being made consonant with his, joining your will with his? So that, that helped contribute to, my, contribute to my vocation. I hope it does to yours. Whether you're already married or a priest or already are living out your vocation, to live it out all the more faithfully, all the more joyfully, all the more boldly for the good of society, the good of the church, the good of our families and our communities, for the good of ourselves. Or if you're still discerning your vocation, if you're still thinking, what is God calling me to? Is he asking me to date this girl or marry this man for, for marriage, whether we be a young a young man or a young woman, or maybe not so young. Or maybe we're a young man or not so young who's thinking about priesthood. How are the different events in your life, how are the different people in your life helping you to discern, whether explicitly helping you by, by their words and their advice, or implicitly by their own witness. All the different circumstances of our life can help us discern. And I pray that they help you. Maybe you're a young woman thinking about marriage, or maybe your heart is being pulled towards... Whoop. <laughs> People don't typically recognize that there's others on the sidewalk sometimes, and we just had someone fly right by. So hopefully, if you're watching, you can be safe when you're um, riding your bikes or when you're walking, and, and, uh, and recognize there's other people on the sidewalk too. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? Maybe you're a young woman. Thinking about, um, thinking about religious life. And I'd love for you to, 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 to give some heartfelt thought to that. Because our nuns, our religious sisters, are wonderful, wonderful, strong women. Yes, they may be meek. Yes, they may be 
um, um, hidden away in cloisters or monasteries, but they can also be very bold, very strong, and in their meekness they can be all the stronger because they recognize themselves as brides of Christ, that they are married to Christ in a, in a vocational way. And isn't that awesome? Um, that, that, that there are women in the world who are, who are consecrated to the Lord and they give their lives as a beautiful witness to that marriage between God and man, between that marriage that is... Um, that is God's love for His church. And, and so I, I, I invite you to consider um, praying, certainly, but also considering religious life. Yourself, or if you know a young girl, a young woman, who could consider it. There's a great um, community of uh, religion, there's a great, um, um, uh, um, what, do, what do we call it? It's not a congregation, but it's, it's a community of um, major superiors of women religious. I think it's called the CMSWR. Uh, I have to double check that here. Um, and it's a great community because there's, there's so many beautiful communities out there. And, um, and if you're looking for one, you can find them right locally here in our own Diocese of Springfield. Or you can find it just by going online, as I did when I was young. Um, CMSWR, I think that's what it's called. The Congregation of the Community of, of um, Major Superiors of Women Religious. I think that's what, who they're called. But they're, it's a wonderful community. Um, and they've got great resources. And I know that there are others as well. Other communities of women religious, men religious. You can find them right online. Um, and, 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 but there are some great resources. So when we find those, I'll, we'll, pu- we'll pull that up. Maribel says, good evening, Father Piers. What are some key guidance advice you can give to young Catholics getting married in the Catholic Church and enriching building a devout Catholic family? Thank you and God bless. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Um, it's kind of something I've already been talking about, right? So discernment is the first step, to discern a marriage, but also good preparation. You know, I really, I really would ask you to, to impose upon your priests and your family members to help you prepare and to help you discern. You know, a, a religious vocation of, of priesthood or religious life needs to be discerned. And we do for six or eight years in preparation, in formation, in discernment. And then we're ordained. And then we are um, consecrated. Then we accept um, perpetual vows, whether simple or solemn. It takes time for a priest, for a nun. To, to be prepared. And so too does it take time for a young man and woman to be prepared. Now I'm not saying it's going to take six to eight years. No, because your formation is, is openness to each other as a young man, as a young woman. Or like I said, an older man, an older woman who are um, perhaps discerning um, after a lifetime of singlehood or maybe a, a previous marriage that, that ended, in, um, ended in death or was never validly um, validly uh, uh, entered into. So, um, so wh- however we find ourselves approaching and discerning marriage, give it time. Give it preparation. Come to know yourself. Come to know the other that is the, the one to be your spouse. And, and ask your family and friends to help you to discern well. And ask your priest to, to help you. Here at St. John the Evangelist, we expect at least nine months, maybe even a year of preparation before we head to the wedding day. And in that time, the couple meets with me or with Father Barrent, our curate. And we have conversation about the dignity of marriage and the nature of marriage, the theology of marriage. But we also talk about the practicality of marriage. But you know what? I'm not going to be able to know all the practical things of marriage. And I'm not going to pretend to know. So I also invite married couples, whether they be 10 years married or 20 years married or even 40 years married, to help me in that. And we have a great program here using um, Beloved. And Beloved is a sacramental preparation program for marriage on Formed and on um, 
through the Augustan Institute. So thank you for contributing to Formed because you're contributing to the preparation of young couples who use that. Thank you for your generosity in making Formed available to all our families, but especially to our young couples preparing for marriage. And so they go through that program together with married couples here at St. John's. And we, um, and we prepare for marriage in time. And once married, I just invite you to practice, continue that formation, to practice your faith, bringing your, your, yourselves and your spouse to Mass each week, maybe even throughout the week in different occasions, praying together. Today we had a great day of adoration, Wednesday. But maybe there's an adoration chapel that's open near you. Maybe you can spend an hour together in adoration. And maybe once you have children, well, one family member has to spend time. Maybe one family member has to spend time uh, watching the kids, right? And so one will cover an hour, and then one will be at home. Then the other will cover an hour, and the other will be at home with the kids. So we adapt, we adjust, integrating our faith into our lives. You know, you know a great practice that Pope Benedict had as a young child with his family in, uh, when he was born in, in Bavaria, they would read on, um, on Saturday evening, the vigil of Sunday. They would be home from work or from play, and the family would come together and read the readings for the Sunday Mass the following day. And they would, be, they would pray together then, hearing them together as a family the night before, and then they would hear it at Mass the following day. They were already familiar with it. They were ready to hear it and to, and to uh, contemplate it, meditate on it. That could be a good practice. Maybe we've got young kids and they're not going to pay attention much. But, but there are wonderful um, practices of, of, of being able to teach our children prayer, teach our ch children faithfulness. And, and, and maybe some of our own families can, can share some uh, words of advice here on this this stream right now. So thank you for your question and, um, and, and I invite you to, to um, impress upon good family and friends to help you with some practical advice, but also um, to entrust yourselves to the Lord. Always, Jesus, I trust in you. Simple action, doesn't need to be a great, great action of, of, of um, entrustment. It's just a simple action of saying, Jesus, I trust in you and living that out in our lives and seeking out good resources. Excuse me. Seeking out good resources. Like I said, formed is great or um, some good Catholic literature um, that we can find. There's a lot of great books out there now on child rearing and, and parenting and, and good practices. So I invite you to, um, to look those up and and, um, and EWTN has a great resource library. A local Catholic bookstore can have a lot of great resources there. Um, I know uh, Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle, who's been visiting here at St. John's in the past. Uh, we've, we've been blessed to have her. She was supposed to speak here uh, for our, give us a Women's Day retreat. Um, she, she visited once and, and uh, twice actually, and, um, and, and has some great books on, on sanctifying Sundays or blessing us um, and, and seeing God's blessing in the families and the witness of the saints. So I invite you to, um, to, to help out, help each other out, and, and, and make the church a community, not just of one day activity once a week, but a community of vitality with, with resources available. And we hope to be as good with that as well. Okay, so I am going to pull up uh, I don't know if it's getting dark. I can't see here. It's probably getting a little dark, so we're going to be ending up here soon. Um, it's almost 8 o'clock. We'll hear the bells toll, and then we'll say goodbye. But I did want to see... Um, I did want to see if there were other questions. And I did want to see... Uh, uh, yeah, it is a CMSWR. There we are. I knew it. Yay. <laughs> I'm not going totally, totally forgetful here. It's the communities, the Council of Major Superiors of Women Religious. That's what it is. C-M-S-W-R. The Council of Major Superiors of Women Religious. And I know, I know personally, um, many wonderful sisters locally here in our, 
in our diocese who serve at, as Sisters of St. Joseph. I've known um, some of them in my experience, Sisters of St. Joseph of Chambury, who were um, my school teachers at St. Mary's in Lee when I was growing up, but also the great visitation nuns and the Dominican nuns here in, um, here in, in our own diocese. But you know what? There's also, we've, we've had um, uh, one, beautiful sisters who visited us here um, once we had Sister um, Mother now, now Mother Consecrata, who is um, a Servidora sister. She is a, uh, I want to say, I think they're called, and forgive me if I'm wrong, uh, she's a member of the community of the IVE, the Institute of the um, Incarnate Word, and they are religious sisters and um, religious men, priests included, who, um, who are uh, sister servants of the Virgin of Matara, I think it is. They're the Servidora sisters. And then I knew so many beautiful sisters out in Rome uh, whom, I, whom I remember to this day and hold in my heart in my prayer. And, um, but the uh, CMSWR, the Council of... Oh, we're going to get it right again. Let's try to find this. The Council of Major Superiors of Women Religious. Um, I have known a lot of these, a lot of these communities in, in my experience, and they are just solid um, and, and, and bold and, and, and active and, and youthful and engaging uh, communities that I would, I would highly recommend you to, to visit and to see. Um, I, 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 like I said, I, just, I, I, trust their, I trust their discernment. I trust their formation, as they do of so many of our uh, local uh, communities here. And I would just encourage you to, um, to check out their resources online. And I'd love for you to, um, to, to see if we could find some wonderful young men and women to serve as priests and, and sisters here in, our, here are in our parishes, in our diocese. And maybe not just to serve here, but to be found here. Maybe there's a young man, young woman, who's thinking about religious life right here, right now. Maybe they're in your community, in your family. Why not ask them? Why, why couldn't they be our future priests, our future nuns, our brothers and our sisters? Maybe. Okay. So we got a few more questions. My little sister is a sister. Way to, way to go. Yeah, we've got a lot of great sisters. I know, in our families. Sadly, they go out outside the diocese. We want them to come back. We want to bring them. We want them to establish um, more communities together with the ones that we have already, as I mentioned. Sisters of Notre Dame, Sisters of St. Joseph. To encourage uh, all of these communities to, to have a robust uh, faith life, to have a robust community life, to have a robust uh, witness in the world, in, in, in this community here. So please invite them to join uh, join our local communities and to consider some of these other communities as well and maybe bringing them here. My best friend, he's got a, um, he's, his own sister is a sister. So his sister is a sister. And, um, and, and he's a good friend of mine. And, 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 uh, and so he's in his own family. He's got, you know, uh, priests and women religious and, and married people and children and young and old. And it's just like, you know, those are our families. That we, we are all types within our own families. And so let's build up these families. Really great. Can you recommend a particular guide for the extraordinary form? Can we create a fundraiser to buy them for people to use while in attendance? That's a great question. Uh, Hildy, thank you. I can't, unfortunately, I can't recommend a good guide for the extraordinary form um, because I, I wouldn't be able to give the best recommendation. I, I just don't know um, what's available myself. So I'm sorry that I can't give a recommendation, but I know that some of our priests, if you were to ask those who celebrate Mass here, I think of Father Ryan Sliwa, uh, Father uh, John Lassard, Father <coughs> Frank Furman, uh, <coughs> they, would, uh, they would have greater recommendations. But you know what I'd love, uh, especially if we were to do a fundraiser? Yes, please come join our worship commission. Our worship commission helps us with our liturgy, with our um, different worship activities here. That includes the ordinary form and the extraordinary form. That includes adoration and processions and all these things. And, and, and they're always looking for new members who could come up with great ideas uh, such as yours. So please, um, 
please, please come and share some good ideas and, and consider joining our worship commission or any of our commissions, our spiritual life commission, our human, fa family, and human, uh, family and human life commission, our Christian service commission, our faith formation commission, or maybe some commissions on our, um, on our uh, finance council. We're looking to establish a stewardship commission to help foster stewardship and, 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 and uh, personal care and, and, and parochial care of our parish. Uh, as well as our buildings and maintenance commission. And I'm saying these commissions not because I want bureaucracy, no. But I want a community that's involved, engaged, and conversant. I want a community that discusses these good ideas. So it's not just me and you, but it's all of us together. And, and, and we can share good ideas and have a good forum. I, uh, I'd love uh, to be able to give you a recommendation, but I know there are others together who can give these recommendations. So we want to provide a forum for that conversation. And, and we really believe that these commissions of our pastoral council, our finance council, really can provide a great forum. So uh, please consider joining and, and, uh, and, and sharing some good ideas. I heard the bells, but I see that there's one more question. So we're gonna uh, take a look at that. Marianne is asking, when you put a piece of the host in the chalice, I think you meant chalice here, I heard that it is for the brotherhood of the priest. What is the brotherhood of the priest? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, Marianne. Um, you're asking specifically what's called the fractio panis. And it's great that you're asking this, Marianne, because you know what? Some of our own parishioners were just asking it themselves like a week ago. How providential is that? So I had the chance to look this up and to, to, to study this a little bit more. Again, the fractio panis, the breaking of the bread, right? After consecration. Um, just before we receive Holy Communion ourselves, the priest fractures, breaks the bread as Christ broke the bread. And in that breaking of the bread, in the breaking of the bread, did you hear that? That, was, that car is from 19, what? It was like a Model T. So it's 1910, 1911. That was a great car. So maybe you heard the horn, and I hope you did. But uh, some neighbors giving us a nice little toot. So <laughs> a nice honk of the horn. Um, the fractio panis is the breaking of the bread, and, and Christ's body was broken. Now, his, now, what I mean by that is not any, no bones of his were broken, but, but he died on the cross. He suffered on the cross. And when Christ died on the cross, when he suffered death on the cross, that is the separation of the soul and the body, right? The soul and the body separate. And... And, um, and, and when the soul and the body separate, the body returns to the earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, doesn't it? The body has no more life, it's just a corpse. When the soul and the body separate, that's death. When the blood separates from the body, it no longer has life, it's no longer vivified. And so, when, we, when, when Christ's body was broken, when his soul and, and body were separated, he shared our death. But because he is God, fully God and fully man, even though he suffered our human death, life was not put to death. Human life came to an end, but eternal life was already there. Because he is God and he is man. And so in the resurrection, the body and the blood, the soul and the body come back together. And in the mass, in the mass, the body and the blood come together. And, 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 and it is fully the human person. And so when the priest celebrates Holy Mass, he has to receive both. The, the consecrated bread and the consecrated blood. He has to receive both the body and the blood because in his person, the priest is, it's not, it's, not the, it's not the human person who is the priest, it's the divine person who is Jesus Christ who is the eternal high priest. And Christ Jesus is the one who's offering the sacrifice. Jesus is the one who's, who's celebrating the Mass. 
And I, as a priest, and all my brother priests, are just instruments of Christ. Offering His words. And offering uh, His sacrifice. And so the, the priest breaks the bread to be shared with the world. The body of Christ that vivifies and constitutes the mystical body of Christ that is the church, that is you and I, united in communion. And, and, and when he receives that gift in the person of Christ, celebrating the Mass, offering the sacrifice, the body and the blood are together again. And we are alive. We are alive. And so that action of the Mass the, is, 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 is very much a sign of the action of Christ in His resurrection. Offered on the cross, sacrificed, the victim, the priest, the altar, sacrificed and, and, and died on the cross. We celebrate that in the Mass. And then the resurrection at the same Mass as the body and the blood come together and then are joined in our own body and blood. And when we receive Holy Communion as faithful, we receive totally Christ. All of Christ. Whether we receive just a small um, particle of that host, whether we receive a large host, whether we receive just a drop of the precious blood, we are receiving all of Christ. But in the Mass, in the action of Christ as priest, He, he is receiving the, the body and the blood together. It's, 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 it's an authentic as it were, sacramental resurrection in some way, I would call it. And there's, that's a beautiful mystery. The fractio panis. The bread and the wine consecrated apart are now commingled together. Or are rather, are, are, are brought together. The body and the blood are together again. Wow. And, and, and just as we have this great theological significance, just as we have the great theological significance of, of the water in baptism, we use the simple water, a simple sign, but a profound one. And so too, this simple action of, of mixing the, the, the bread and the wine, consecrated apart, now together are, 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 are reunited. Um, there's also a historical significance to it. So there's theological significance. There's simplicity to it in some way. A simple action of just mixing consecrated bread and wine together. But there's also a historical significance to it because it used to be in communities that were separated and apart in Rome, they would, they would um, the Holy Father, the Pope, would be celebrating Mass and he would break the bread as we break the bread and share it. And he would share it with other communities from that Mass that was celebrated in Rome, in his church. He would share it with others and it was a sign of communion between the Pope and, 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 and uh, the priests and the faithful of Rome, the people of Rome in, in different communities, one church and another church. And that, there was a historical sign of that. And, and, and so there was a sense of fraternity, brotherhood of priests, the Pope and the other priests. But truly, it's a sign of the communion. Now that is no longer practiced in that kind of symbolic way of communion. 
Now it is practiced in our sharing in the one bread that is Jesus Christ. The one mass that's celebrated in all the world and in all time. And communion that we receive and share. Beautiful. Just to ponder and contemplate the mystery of the Mass. I invite you to, to enter into the mystery of the Mass all the more. And to see how life-giving it is. So I, I encourage you, I bless you. I know we've got some great resources online, as I said, for the Mass. Some great books that we can find on the Mass. And, um, and even here at St. John's, we are running a, a series on the Mass that's beginning this week. And we can still sign up. We've still got some availability. Thursday nights, unfortunately, are full. But, um, but Wednesday morning and Sunday afternoon, still have space. So if you wanted to join in, reach out to the parish office. And uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, they're studying Father, um, Father Bishop Robert Barron's book and, 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 and series on the Mass. But there's also wonderful, uh, wonderful other resources on the Mass that I would invite you to consider. The Spirit of the Liturgy by Pope Benedict or Writings of the Popes um, on, on, on the Mass. Uh, Pope uh, St. John Paul II's encyclicals on the Eucharist and, and on the Mass, Dominique Cene, which we read and, and considered in one of our videos. You can see it on our YouTube channel. Um, but also Robert, uh, Romano Guardi, uh, uh Guardini, I think, had a book on the Mass. Um, there's just so many resources. A good Catholic bookstore will have great stuff on the Mass. So, I'm going to stop there because it is a little dark. I don't even know if you can see me anymore. I can see my shadow from the lights. But it is so awesome. And if it's dark, my gosh, that's just going to be weird. But awesome to see you. It was a great talk. Hopefully, um, if you can't see me, you could hear, hear a few words. And I'm so excited to have shared this with you today. So, God bless you. God be with you. And... Um, and I look forward to sharing some more time with you. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bye, everyone.